uh, today we're happy to have uh, guests from the University of Guelph. Uh, so Ryan Addison will be, I guess this is a follow-on to work that you guys did last year and an FPGA placement on GPU. Okay, right. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for having me here. As you said, my name is Ryan Patterson, and uh, today I'll be presenting some of the work I did during my master's under the supervision of Gary Craywall and Shaki Arabi, and also working in conjunction with Christian Vogel. So as a brief overview, we'll talk a bit about the motivation into why we should uh, try and build scalable parallel placement algorithms. And then we'll talk about some of the parallel algorithms that have been developed in the past for FPGA placement. And we'll address the issue of scalability by reviewing some of the theory behind it. I'll talk about Enbell's law, Gustafsson Barsa's law, as well as ISO efficiency, which is a metric we use to measure scalability in an algorithm. And we'll talk a bit about the structured parallel patterns, which are ways of organizing computation that are parallel friendly, essentially and have good scalability characteristics, such as math and reduce operations. We'll talk about uh, taking an analytic placement algorithm, star place, and turning that into a scalable placement algorithm for the GPU using these patterns. And we'll review the results. So, FPGAs and the designs that have been targeting them have been growing in accordance with Moore's law. And so the problem sizes are getting larger and larger and placement can take hours or days for large designs. The serial performance of single core CPUs hasn't improved much in the last decade due to the power wall and memory wall challenges. And so parallel computing offers one method for speeding up placement uh, where single files are going to have a uh, So GP GPUs offer a tremendous amount of parallelism in comparison to multi-core architectures. <coughs> So the two algorithms that were developed here at Toronto by Matthew Ann uh, with Gregory Stephan and Ron Betts are PropSpec and SerialProp. So PropSpec uh, evaluates many moves in parallel on different threads and then uh, marks parts of the netlist that have been used during that to detect conflicts and will abandon the move if a conflict arises. This makes it non-deterministic at the same time, it exposes a lot of parallelism. And so the quality, there's a very small loss in quality. It's non-deterministic, and it, but it achieves very good speed ups and a high parallel efficiency. Uh, serial prop, on the other hand, has been modified to be deterministic by having one thread propose uh, non-conflicting moves, and then every other thread can evaluate that move in parallel without risking conflict. So this adds a bottleneck by having a serial portion of the algorithm proposing these uh, non-conflicting moves to be processed in parallel. And, but it is deterministic and it is even serially equivalent. So it maintains the same quality of result that we're looking for. But uh, the speed ups are much smaller and because of that serial bottleneck. Another approach is the half box window decomposition, which basically breaks the FPGA up into regions and performs simulated annealing in, uh, in these localized areas. And the downside to this approach is the swap distance is limited. And so it's performing essentially a local search in each one of these. Blocks can still move across the entire FPGA, but the range limit in the VPR algorithm is, is reduced right off the bat. And as you increase the number of processing elements you want to use, that range becomes smaller and smaller, and the quality degrades more and more as you do that. This approach is deterministic once you've cho chosen a number of cores that you want to run on. Again, the quality is lost there. And it achieves a wide range of speed ups depending on how you want to trade off quality. A CAMIT, or Concurrent Associated Moves Iterative Placement, uh, evaluates a massive amount of swaps in parallel by uh, producing non overlapping swaps using. Uh, a geometric displacement pattern. So here you can see that uh, this green, this green. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> don't use the laser. It's like it's, 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 
them like lasers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this green block here is swapping with this green block that is down and to the right, and it is swapping the block to the left and up one. And so these swaps don't overlap. They're all, uh, they don't overlap, and so you can evaluate them in parallel without risking any uh, hard conflicts. However, it has a lot of soft conflicts, so when one block moves, uh, it's being evaluated as if no other block is moving. And so, uh, in retrospect, that may have turned out to be a bad move because it was unaware of the other blocks moving and it was evaluated. But because they're all evaluated before the move happens, it is still deterministic. And it sees a 5% improvement in quality and obtains good speedups on the GPU that actually grow with the size of the placement. And there's no limit on swap distance because you can generate a pattern that will move across the entire chip. Uh, these basically just scale. And uh, it's also implemented on the GP. I think we might be better. Yeah. It worked. <laughs> okay. So this work is building off the methodology that was used in CAMF, that is using these structured parallel patterns to uh, build a placement algorithm on the GPU. However, we're now targeting an analytic placement algorithm. And that algorithm is start place. So we want to use these patterns to parallelize, to parallelize star place and demonstrate good scalability. Uh, we also want to suggest a formal definition of scalability using the isoefficiency function as a definition, and also suggest a methodology using these parallel patterns to parallelize other parts of CAD. What we've implemented now is a wireline-driven placement, just as star place originally was. And so when we compare against BPR version 4.3 in its wire length driven mode, just bounding box running in fast mode as well, uh, we obtain 75 times faster run times and uh, a 3% reduction in wire length and 26% reduction in critical path flow. But again, uh, we're running it with just bounding box and no timing optimization. No timing optimization and uh, I'm not sure if Explicitly saying bounding box actually turns off the congestion portion of it, <coughs> perhaps. Uh, so yeah, this 26% lower critical path that actually goes away if you uh, optimize VPR with timing driven placement, and it actually improves beyond that. So yeah, what is the comparison when you run VPR in timing driven mode? Because uh, for delay, that's the more relevant comparison. So uh, absolutely, uh, this is mostly just to talk about the start. The star cost model has some benefit to critical path delay over HPWL. But of course, when you target, I think uh, it's around 11% in addition to that or something. That, that means a star place is 11% below or 11% better? Oh, no, no, no. The BPR wins for okay. sure. Uh, <coughs> just again, trying to reiterate that the star model helps with critical path delay. So the speed ups begin on the GPU from the serial implementation of star place at 13 times on our benchmarks and then grows to 31. And the ISO efficiency function of our algorithm is P log P. And we'll get into what that means. So scalable parallel efficiency. So the most famous law, uh, for sure, in parallelizing algorithms is Amdahl's law. And what it does is it tells us for a fixed problem size, speed up is fundamentally limited by the portion of the algorithm, which is inherently serial. And so if our uh, serial portion is 1 over f, then, then we are limited by that value. So for 1 over 9, we're limited to 9 times speed up work. And the, the issue is that when we add new parallel workers from a single core, our speed ups grow very quickly and then begin to dwindle off as we add more and more cores, which means that our efficiency, which is speed up per parallel worker, begins to drop towards zero. And it's a very pessimistic view of parallelism. Gustafsson and Barsis law uh, instead focuses on variable problem sizes. 
So as you add new parallel workers, you add more parallel work for them to do. And then the serial portion grows either at a much lower rate or not at all. And so you obtain neolinear speedups. These are called scaled speedups because it's always in reference to an algorithm, a serial algorithm, performing more work because you've added more parallel work when you added more cores. So, so sorry that you're increasing the number of the problem size in, in that. Yeah, so the example you gave was for a simulation that if you have more cores then you can add more variables yeah. during your simulation. And that way those variables contribute more to the parallel portion than to the serial portion. So that serial portion is in effect gotten smaller. And so then MDOT's law is essentially still applies, but we're changing the serial fraction. Okay. Okay. So along sort of the same lines of how can we increase the problem size as we increase the number of parallel workers, uh, we can quantify that using the ISO efficiency function of an algorithm. Some algorithms have an ISO efficiency function, some do not. What it does is tell us at what rate the problem size will need to grow in relation to the number of parallel workers, such that we can maintain a constant parallel efficiency. So if we grow the input size at this rate, then we will see linear speedups. The one that we uh, will be talking about mostly is P log P. So if this is the number of parallel workers and the problem size, it has to grow more than linearly in relation to the number of parallel workers, but only by a log, logarithmic factor. And so we want to use this as a definition of scalability. Because if an algorithm has an ISO efficiency function, that means that we can obtain linear speedups provided that the problem size increases at a certain rate. So it gives us a theoretical understanding of how it is scalable. Now to implement these, the scalability in practice, we use the parallel patterns which have known ISO efficiency functions. <coughs> and these parallel patterns are basically algorithmic skeletons or templates for performing operations such as map, reduce, and scan. There's a lot of library support from these from companies like Intel's Threading Building Blocks, so plus plus, or NVIDIA's Thrust Library, which is a library we use to target the GPU. These all have known ISO efficiency functions, usually either theta p log p or theta p, and they allow you to program at a very high level and organize your computation at a high level. So one example is the map operation, which is also a transform or applying one operation to many pieces of data in parallel. They're all completely independent, and this makes it an embarrassingly parallel problem, and the ISO efficiency function is theta p. So if we have eight numbers and we want to square them on eight processors, we can do that quite easily. They're all independent. If we want to maintain the same efficiency, if we doubled the number of processors here, we'd have to double the work size in order to maintain that efficiency. <coughs> so the reduce is another one of these patterns, and we use it to reduce a set of values down to a single value. So common examples would be performing a sum or finding the min and max set of values. So if we want to reduce, for example, 32 numbers using eight processors, divide up the numbers to each of the eight processors, four per each. And if we're doing addition, then they can each perform the sum. And then at this point, we have eight partial sums left, one for each processor. And we now need to communicate the results between processors. And so the addition that will happen after this so this processor will communicate its value and that one will add. These additions are more expensive than the additions that happened in the serial portion due to overhead of uh, communication, synchronization barriers, and later on some of these processors are going to be idle. Okay. So it is in this section where we see uh, overhead being added. A category reduce is a sometimes called the reduce by key, is basically many reductions in parallel. So you can perform um, different sums in parallel. So the ISO efficiency function of reduce is a little bit harder to derive. So the serial runtime of adding together n numbers is roughly n memory lookups when the complexity is linear. 
the parallel runtime of this algorithm begins in n over p for the first edition, first few editions in the serial portion there. And then there is k log p runtime for the rest, because there's logarithmic steps here. And the k is meant to uh, take into consideration the overhead of these editions. They're k times more expensive than the editions that happened in the serial portion. So speed up is just the serial runtime divided by the parallel, and the efficiency is the speed up divided by the number of parallel workers. And we can reduce that to this equation here. And so if we want to keep the uh, efficiency constant, then as long as n grows at the rate of p log p, this fraction will remain constant. And so the efficiency remains constant, and we see the linear speed up. So that is why the iso efficiency function of a reduced is theta p log p. So there are other patterns that are available that build off of reduce and map, basically. Uh, you can do a stable partition, which is sorting based on a predicate. You can do a radix sort, which is many stable partitions, essentially. And permutation is another pattern that we'll be using. And that pattern uh, just performs many lookups in parallel. So basically give it an array of indices and then another array to perform that lookup on. And it has the iso efficiency function of data. Like a map. So it's sort of a case study. We're going to be parallelizing the star place, which is an analytic place in algorithm. So again, the star place is analytic. It's wire length driven completely. It uses the star plus cost model. It uses shrubbery for pre placement, which is a pre placement algorithm to fix IOs. It then, uh, for the solving the equations, it uses successive over relaxation. And successive over relaxation will have different convergence rates depending on the order in which variables are solved. And so it also has a variable ordering heuristic which is related to shrubbery. Uh, initially, it uh, performs n iterations, whereas n is just the square root of the number of blocks in the placement. And then it performs recursive by partitioning to legalize that placement. And then it reduces the number of iterations it will perform in the next round. So initially, in the next round, it's going to perform 90% of the iterations it did previously. And so by doing it this way, the solver results in less illegal solutions throughout the process and makes the, legal, the legalization easier, and they both converge to a single cost. Okay, so <coughs> a quick question on that. Yeah. So your NSOR iterations means you're sort of the mid you're it's your convergence criteria for your matrix solver. So rather than waiting for it actually to truly converge, you just say, I'm going to run it n times wherever everything is, even if my uh, convergence criteria for the iterative solver hasn't been met, I just stop. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. So even if it's beyond <coughs> convergence, we still go. How, how uh, oh, so if it has converged, you keep going anyway. Yeah, we haven't, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any sense of how far you are from convergence usually when you stop, like after this limit? Like, are you pretty uh, close it, to convergence anyway, or, or you're pretty far? It will vary uh, depending on the structure of the netlist. But uh, it gets closer to convergence, but we're not trying to converge because we're not that, we're not trying to build the, lead, the uh, final result from that convergence. Sure. Uh, so the, I understand the reasoning. I'm just I'm curious whether the matrix usually has mostly solvers mostly converged or mostly not, like if this is a big optimization or not. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's mostly converged. Like it, okay. it would be difficult to legalize it effectively the first time. So we're going to use the star place cost model, which is a variation on the star model. Uh, so we take a hyper edge and we replace it with a graph by adding a new node. So instead of these three uh, blocks here being connected together with a hyper edge, they all connect to a new node that we've added, which we call the center of gravity. The cost is uh, independent in each direction, we compute the x cost dependent of, independent of the y and solve for them separately as well. It is differentiable like the star model. Uh, in order to compute it, we use intermediate values to help uh, with the parallelization, essentially. So V sub L is the sum of the x positions of all the blocks in the net, and U sub L is the sum of the squared positions of the blocks in the net. And that way, the center of gravity is then just the sum of the x positions divided by k sub l, which is the size of the net list. So it's just the average x position. And then the cost we get from this formula here, which just has a plus 1 
to make sure that it remains differential. Okay, so why do we use star plus as the cost model in the star place? It's because the star model overestimates large uh, the cost of large nets and underestimates the cost of small distances. So here we have plotted for a two thin net at different distances and the costs that would be produced using a linear cost model as well as star model and the star plus cost model. So the star model underestimates small distances and overestimates larger distances and begins to grow. In contrast, star plus gets very close to uh, linear as it grows for a two point net, which is the most common size. So our equation system is nonlinear, and star place uses successive order relaxation for that. It's an inherently serial algorithm, because as I said before, the order in which you solve these variables will change the convergence rate, and that's why we have that heuristic ordering. And so to parallelize it, we actually have to change the solver from being successive order over relaxation to Jacobi. Uh, the Jacobi method actually performs better in terms of runtime and reducing cost than successive over relaxation. And the reason for that is whenever a variable is solved in successive over relaxation, you have to update the cost and the center of gravity for all the nets connected to that block. And so every net then has to be reevaluated for each one of its blocks. In contrast to that, the Jacobi evaluates the cost and center of gravity of the nets once and then updates the block positions and then repeats. So the updating of the cost of the net, because that square root operation is the most expensive computation that happens. And so you have to update once for every net to block connection, which is at least two, because every net must connect two blocks. And so we obtain actually higher quality solutions faster using the Jacobi. Okay. This is the equation for solving the Jacobi. The new block position we begin with the block positions, use a map operation to square them, then use a permutation to uh, explain them out to the netlist. So here, net zero has looked up the value of 25 for its first block and value of nine for its second block in that permutation. And then we perform a category reduce, which will perform sums for all of the nets in parallel. And we obtain our u sub L. Now, v sub L is very similar. Uh, just the expositions are not squared. And uh, again, we do this for the y dimension as well. And because all of four of these are similar and follow the same patterns, we can do them all together at once. So once we've computed u and v for each net, we then use a map operation to compute the center of gravity and the cost from those values. And it's a constant time operation. And once we have that, we again do a permutation. Uh, this time, we're, it's sorted by a block. So the block has looked up all of its net values, perform a category reduce, and we've computed the uh, numerator for the Jacobi iteration. Computing the denominator, again, is very similar. Uh, it uses the same pattern, so again, we can compute both of them at the same time. Uh, fused together. And then we have the numerator and denominator for each block, and a map operation performs that division to give us the updated position of all the blocks. Now, once we have solved for new positions of blocks, we then need to legalize them using recursive by partitioning. To do that, we partition the FPGA recursively uh, prior to doing any of this. So the full FPGA is at the top, and we split it vertically into the left and right sides, and then split it horizontally, and we continue to do that until there's only one location at each of the leaves. And then our parallel partitioning works by first sorting using a bucket sort. All the blocks in each di in the dimension that we're in the X dimension as well as in the Y dimension. And then we assign all the blocks to the root region using a map operation. And then we will continually compute the occupancy of the region, the current occupancy of the regions all together using a map operation. And use a map again to reassign a block 
to either the left or right child region. So that it moves down the tree. And then once we've done that reassignment, that will break our ordering, because we initially want it sorted by first by region and then by next position. And when we uh, reassign the blocks, it will break the ordering in the other dimension. So we repair that using a stable partition. Uh, that will be explained better with an example later. <laughs> okay, and we continue this until we've reached the leaves of the tree, and then we do a map operation again to assign those blocks to the location in that region. So when we're trying to decide whether a block should move to the left or right child during that map operation, we need to know how the blocks are ordered within that within the dimension that we're splitting. So here, we want to do a vertical split, so we want to assign the smallest x values to the left side and the larger x values to the right side. Before we can do that, we need to know also how many blocks are currently in this region, as well as the capacity of the left and right side. Uh, so here, we will assign to the left side if the rank is less than the occupancy of the parent region minus the right child's capacity. So we think about that as if we have 10 blocks in total and the right child can hold 8, then the smallest two values must be assigned to the left side. Okay. And a similar logic follows. And if our rank is less than our left child's capacity, uh, so if the left child can hold 5 values and we're one of the smallest 5, then we could potentially go to the left side. And the only other condition there is if that would actually be beneficial. If you're closer to the left side, then you can go there. So here we take care of overflowing the right side, and here we take care of not overflowing the left side and moving to the left if it's beneficial. So to talk about again, how do we repair the ordering and what's the problem that arises? Initially, we'll have our blocks here, which are the coordinates are inside of the block, the x and y coordinates, and they're all sorted in the x dimension. So once we perform the map operation, some of them will be assigned to the left child and some will be assigned to the right child. Sorry, this is the block sorted in the y dimension, the same block coordinates. So once we've assigned some, the bottom three here to the left child, the remaining five are at the right child, but well, this breaks our ordering in the other dimension because the smallest x values is not necessarily the smallest y value. And we use these data structures to make a lot of our decisions. Okay. And so to repair this, we use a stable partition where the value is zero if you're assigned to the left child and one if you're assigned to the right child. And then we perform the stable partition and it will organize them left child and right child and they will remain ordered in the y dimension because it's stable partitioning. Then we can split in the, then we can do a horizontal split. And these two green values were assigned to the left child and the yellow was assigned to the right child and then in this region Two were assigned to the left and three to the right child in the tree. And again, that will break the ordering in the other dimension. And so we use a stable partition to repair that again. So this works for any number of regions. Now we also need to find out how many blocks are in a region. And because we have those sorted arrays, then we can. Uh, so, for example, this was in the x dimension, uh, what regions were assigned to the blocks. To find where the occupancy, we find where does the region begin in that ordering and where does it end. To find where it begins, we use a map operation and compare adjacent values in the array. And when the two values are, are different regions, then we know that we're on the boundary of a region and we can perform conditional right to an array where we mark the start index of that region. We add a small dummy value to the beginning so that uh, the left neighbor is always a valid lookup. We just need to make sure it's distinct from all other regions. We do the same then to uh, find the end of the region. And then from there, computing the occupancy is just the end minus the start. You know how many blocks were assigned to each region. So now we've parallelized legalization as well as the solver using these parallel patterns. Uh, the, we've gotten rid of the preplacement because it only gives a small improvement and would be fairly difficult to parallelize. 
and we don't get the added benefit of uh, that shrubbery pre-placement producing a good ordering for our solver. And so we've simply removed it because the Jacobi can't benefit from an ordering. So as you asked before about how converged the solution is initially, uh, this one is actually missing the first one, which is a bit more converged. But here you can see uh, these are the blocks in the benchmark B19, which is about 306. Uh, 1,000 blocks, and this is right after that iteration where they exist in the placement. And so here's an animation showing the drawing the placement just before legalizing. So each time the solver is making less illegal solutions and they become easier and easier to legalize without uh, disrupting the quality of the solution. How did you, did you, cons did you change your matrix in between those or not? Or is it just the fact that you're doing very few iterations that they don't move very much? Right. It's just the fact that you're, so, okay, so you're really relying on that. It's like yeah. you, you just will, we're gonna reassign where you are. Like you don't just assign it to a bin, you also move its location, I assume, and then you don't allow many iterations, so it just can't move much. Is that a correct statement? Or? Uh, I'm just trying to figure out how the legalization works. So you assign things to bins to spread them out. Well, it B makes a fully uh, legalized solution, uh, the repressive part partition. Right, so you not only assign the bins, you change their location. Is yes. that correct? Okay, so you've changed the location of every block, and then you're relying on the fact that you're going to go back to the Jacobi with no additional constraints or fixed points or anything, but you would just do very few iterations, therefore things won't move much. Right. Okay. Uh, that's exactly what we did. Uh, but we have, since then, you know, experimented with adding uh, pseudo pins into those legal positions, but because we've stuck with uh, this strategy of solving and legalizing, it hasn't helped much, and in fact hindered it a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but It might just be the video is <laughs> focus. So the benchmarks we use are the IWLS 1999 benchmarks. Uh, here are some of the characteristics. The largest one has 306,000 that we just saw in the animation, and the smallest 124,000. This mean net size uh, comes into play a fair bit. Uh, like I said before, the SOR versus Jacobi, the Jacobi does better because it only solves the cost of the net once per net, whereas SOR does it for every block to net connection. So this mean net size uh, correlates to the performance. So your CLP is just the one block? Sorry? What is meant by CLP here? It's just the one block? So when you, the CLB column, what does that mean? That's how many CLBs are in the So we define, what is the definition of CLB here? Uh, placeable element. Placeable element. Uh, the I is also a placeable element. So these are probably like, these gates. These were ASIC benchmarks, is that correct? Uh, so they're probably basic gates. I am. Or model this four lots, or not sure? To me, they're a netless file. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So in terms of quality, again, running against uh, DPR and it's 4.3 in bounding box mode only, uh, we achieve a 3% reduction in wire length. So what is the DPR architecture you said Four LUT sanitized R. Is that the question? So you're basically setting it the unclustered, unclustered architecture. So there's like every location just one LUT. I believe so. That's why, like, so there's four inputs and one output, and that's why they're quite large in terms of homogeneous. In terms of runtime, we run the parallel algorithm on the GTX 980, and VPR is run on the Intel i7 2.8 here's processor. Uh, and the mean speed up we get over VPR is 77.7 7 times. And that's the sphere of rows with the size of the placement. 
So now I'm uh, comparing against star place. What sort of speed ups do we get? Again, star place was run on the same machine as a TPR, and uh, we've normalized the run speed up, of course, to star place. So the GTX 430, which is a GPU that has 96 cores, you can see the benchmarks plotted there, their speed up that they attained. There is a slope, but it's hard to see. The GTX 980 is plotted there, and you can see that we obtained your linear speed ups here. And which uh, benchmarks appear below the line versus above the line is determined by that mean net ratio. Because, again, Star Place is using SOR. So we see more benefit when that mean uh, net to block ratio is high. Uh, so when we start clustering more, we expect the speed ups to also improve. The GTX 980 has about 20 times the number of Twitter cores, and so that's why we see much larger speed ups on that device. So, feature and current work. Right now, we're <coughs> working on. BTR compatibility and heterogeneous benchmarks. And that's, uh, we can technically go through the flow right now. I'm just debugging going through that, so very close. We're also working on congestion driven placement, uh, adding that onto the GPU. And we've already done timing driven placement for uh, CAMF, integrating that now with the analytic algorithm. Future work beyond that is extending to the Titan benchmarks once we have BTR compatibility and also working on hybrid placement with after BTR compatibility to perform uh, analytic placement early on and then similarly near, near the end. Thank you very much. Okay. Any questions? questions? Ask a question I don't practice care a lot about this kind of stuff, scalable patients is something we really care about. Uh, but I have a question. I think the one thing that's quite useful is uh, when you're doing your experiments, it would be nice to see an architecture that's already been clustered. Uh, what that means is uh, that future architectures there are higher right? We don't just place lots of flip flops, they tend to be grouped together into these bigger elements that we call CLPs. So a CLP, for example, may contain, say, four lots and four flip flops, as opposed to just one lot and one flip flop. Right. It would be interesting to see if, uh, the effect of that on your QMR. You have a hierarchical architecture? Right. Uh, we wanted to experiment more with that, of, uh, perhaps even doing packing during that, uh, just increasing the capacity essentially of them, and uh, because we really benefit from the larger it is. So I think that's that might be what we'll be experimenting when we go in that direction, uh, but trying to optimize that to keep the problem size as large as possible. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think with VTR compatibility, is when we can experiment more with heterogeneous. Architectures as well and larger cluster size. Thank you. Yes. For, well, when you gave uh, time results early in the presentation, uh, were those post routing? And if so, what routing architecture did you use? <coughs> uh, so we used the same architecture during the placement. It comes with the VPR or VPR 4.3 that for you sanitized. Yeah, I can't remember if that's like four wires or something else. Uh, <laughs> Okay. I guess uh, it's an architecture. Maybe just one suggestion for um, when you when you move to the Titan benchmarks and heterogeneous FPGAs, I think that's an important thing to do because that, that does add some extra challenges. Another thing I suggest is basically use a routing architecture that is uh, like kind of realistically complicated. Okay, what I mean by that is it has longer wires and shorter wires. It adds some additional challenges for placement that are interesting to see Definitely. because basically your uh, delay versus distance function is now nonlinear. Uh, which, if you used all length one wires, you don't see. Um, mm -hmm. But if you use like a, a routing architecture that's more representative of what's actually used, you do see that, and it might give. It's in a sense a little more challenging because it doesn't fit uh, linearized models as well. But it could lead to some interesting. Well, how do you deal with that? Absolutely. Or is it an issue? Maybe it turns out it doesn't really matter. But I'd suggest just use an architecture that has those features. So, so <coughs> to help you with Bond's point, we do have provided BTR a um, a go-to architecture. Reference architecture where everything's been tuned and optimized so that it's so that it's reasonable. Uh, that way, when you run your experiments, you don't have to worry. Oh man, did I? Is that the right cluster size of the one? Yep. Uh, wire link. It's all uh, it's all taken care of. Is that architecture? Uh, what do you call it? ER. 
Okay. I'll look that up for sure once we uh, finish verifying that we're parsing that. That's correct. It's actually taking quite a bit of time because you don't have to learn about all the architecture stuff to do these experiments. That sounds great. Okay. Guess if there are no more, okay. thank the speaker.